It was January 2, 1999, around 6 p.m. 11-year-old McKelly Biggs and her 9-year-old sister Kimber were playing outside their family's home with a few other kids from their Mesa neighborhood. Tracy Biggs was on the front porch swing with her cousin watching the children play. The women then decided to go inside. About five minutes later, her youngest daughter Kimber walked inside and said she couldn't find McKelly anywhere. Kelly Biggs was born on May 31, 1987, to Tracy and Darian Biggs. As time went by, the family grew, and the girl became the eldest sister with one sister and one brother. The young girl lived with her parents and siblings in Mesa, Arizona. At 11 years old, she was a distinguished sixth grade student, fun and very intelligent. She also had considerable musical talent and played the clarinet. Mikkel dreamed of becoming a Disney animator and everything seemed to indicate that one day she would take the stage to show the world her great art. On January 2, 1999, around 6 p.m., Kimber and McKelly, aged 9 and 11 respectively, went out to play on the street in front of their house. Tracy Biggs was on the front porch swing with her cousin watching the children play. The women then decided to go inside. Suddenly, the older sister said she had heard the ice cream truck and ran inside to get money. When she came back out, she hopped on Kimber's bicycle and started riding in large circles. While waiting for the ice cream truck, Kimber felt cold and told Mikkel she was going to get a jacket and would be right back. Crossing the street before entering the house, she looked back and saw her sister pedaling. Little did she know that would be the last time she saw her. When she came back out, the bicycle was lying on the road, its wheels still spinning. Approaching, she saw the coins Mikkel had brought to pay for the ice cream scattered on the ground. She looked for her sister, but she was nowhere to be found. It seemed as if the earth had swallowed her up, as only a few seconds had passed between the moment she entered the house and her return to the street. Immediately, the girl notified her mother, and they began to search for her. Kimber and Tracy checked a neighbor's house for any sign of Mikkel, but no one seemed to have any idea where she was. Then Tracy went back into the house and called the cops. She knew something was wrong. She also contacted one of her friends who also lived in the neighborhood, who contacted people in their church. By the time the cops arrived, there were probably 50 or 60 people that were out looking for McKelly. Soon the entire area around where McKell was last seen was cordoned off with yellow tape. The streets were filled with volunteers wanting to help with the efforts to find the little girl and journalists from various media outlets. The disappearance of the 11-year-old girl shook the entire community and became news across the United States. It was not just because an innocent seemed to have been abducted, but because nobody saw anything. There were no footprints or clues to follow to uncover the truth about what had happened to Mikkel. To determine how much time had passed between the moment Kimber left her sister and returned to the street, investigators reconstructed their steps at the scene with the girl. According to the detective's estimates, it took approximately 20 seconds between the time she saw Mikkel before entering and the moment she came back out to the street to realize she was no longer there. Therefore, whoever took her must have acted very quickly. The officers in charge of the case requested the assistance of police dogs to follow Mikkel's scent. The dogs picked up her scent, but lost it a few meters away. It seemed as if the little girl had vanished without leaving any trace. The idea that someone had put the girl into a vehicle and taken her away became even more plausible. However, when speaking to the neighbors, no one remembered seeing or hearing a vehicle driving down the street just before the disappearance was reported. The officials considered the coins on the ground an indication that the girl had thrown them or dropped them in an attempt to escape. However, on the other hand, no one heard screams, which seemed to contradict the previous assumption. Considering that McKella had mentioned hearing an ice cream truck in the distance shortly before disappearing, one line of investigation pointed to ice cream vendors and the owners of trucks that usually sold in the area, but they were ultimately ruled out. 
Moreover, no one in the area reported hearing the distinctive sound that announces the ice cream truck's arrival. While all this was happening, Mikkel's father, Darian Biggs, received a page to call home as the scene unfolded. When he called the house, Tracy, his then wife, told him that their daughter had gone missing. Darian thought that the words initially didn't make any sense to him. He headed home after hearing the news, and when he arrived at his house, there was already a large police presence in the neighborhood as the initial searches for Michaela began. According to official statistics, less than 1% of missing children are taken from their loved ones and held against their will by a stranger, and Mikkel's case seemed to fall within that percentage. The state police launched a massive search and detained several suspects. In the course of the investigation, they followed more than 10,000 leads that led them to search storage units, rappel down wells, explore abandoned mines, and hypnotize witnesses. The FBI also joined the efforts, conducting polygraph and voice stress tests on some of the suspects and developing a profile of the perpetrator. The police interrogated everyone in the neighborhood, starting with Mikkel's father, Darian, who was almost immediately cleared. However, people continued to suspect him. Darian was a quiet man, described as someone distant, and it seemed he was judged simply for not being particularly demonstrative. Later in an interview, he acknowledged that he had tried to keep his composure for the sake of his family. During these incredibly tough times, he mentioned that he couldn't afford to break down in front of the cameras while his wife and children knew the intense pain he felt over Mikkel's disappearance. Another suspect was a neighbor named D. Lee Blalock, who worked as a landscaper and part-time maintenance staff. The man lived just two blocks away, directly across from where Mikkel took piano lessons and a few doors down from her best friend's house. He had a criminal record, having been previously arrested for sexual assault, child abuse, and unlawful imprisonment. The suspect had an alibi. He claimed that at the time the girl supposedly disappeared, he was at his home watching a football game in his garage. His wife corroborated his statements. Moreover, agents entered his house with his consent and found nothing. One of the Mesa police detectives working on the case mentioned that after investigating the man and discovering he had an alibi, there wasn't much they could do. As investigations continued, D. Lee Blaylock himself offered an interview to a local news station during which he guaranteed he would be one of the people to call 911 if he noticed anything suspicious in the area. To his neighbors, he seemed to be a decent, friendly, and very pleasant man. As part of the efforts undertaken, Posters with Mikkel's school photo and a description were printed. It detailed that the last time she was seen, she was wearing a red shirt with a white stripe across the chest and blue jeans with designs on the sides. These posters saturated the high visibility areas of Mesa. They were placed on store doors and on light poles at major intersections. They also circulated around the city, attached to car windows. However, neither the notices, the investigations, the extensive search operation, nor the police interrogations shed light on the girl's whereabouts. A year later, however, the investigation refocused on D. Lee Blaylock, the neighbor with a criminal record. This happened because in October of 1999, Blaylock was charged with seven felonies for the physical and sexual assault of a neighbor. He was sentenced to 187 years in prison. Investigators re-interrogated the detained man's wife to verify the alibi she had given when interviewed at the start of the investigations. From then on, the woman began to crumble. Being very submissive to her husband, but knowing he was behind bars, she eventually spoke up. She revealed that on the day Mikkel disappeared, she did as her husband asked. First, she brought sandwiches to the garage, and then she stayed away from there, as Dee had requested. She recanted those original statements and said that he had been gone sometime between the hours of 5.30 to about 7.30 at night. Considering Dee's criminal past, the period during which his wife could not account for his whereabouts turned him into the prime suspect in Mikkel's kidnapping. However, Dee repeatedly denied any involvement in the girl's disappearance, and there was no physical evidence linking him to the crime. One of Mesa police investigators mentioned in an interview years later that Dee allegedly made a confession related to Mikkel's case. In his view, everything pointed towards the convict, but the lack of evidence meant they couldn't dismiss other possibilities. Indeed, in the minds of both the family and the investigators, 
His name has continued to surface over the years. In fact, Tracy and Darian, the girl's parents, met with the inmate in prison to ask him face to face about his involvement in the case, but he denied it once more. However, Tracy mentioned that at one point D claimed to have a split personality and that he couldn't be held responsible for what his other personality did. Over the years, authorities released age-progressed images of Michele. Although the case went cold, detectives followed up on any leads that occasionally surfaced, usually third- or fourth-hand information provided by inmates or ex-convicts. The family also remained active and in their desperation even consulted with psychics, a move that also yielded no results. Eventually, her loved ones came to the conclusion that Mikkel was deceased, so on January 2, 2004, they buried a white casket. By 2009, a decade after Mikkel's disappearance, the search had long since ended. However, reports from the time mentioned that the bicycle she rode before vanishing was still leaning against a wall in an evidence storage vault, surrounded by other bikes wrapped in white plastic. At that time, those close to the case said they had only two hopes left that advancements in forensic technology, which were happening exponentially, would help solve the case, or that the perpetrator would decide to confess and end the family's nightmare. The calendar kept moving. In 19 years after the event that changed the Bigs' lives, promising information emerged 2,700 kilometers away. On March 14, 2018, a man walked into the police station in Wisconsin and told the police that his daughters were Girl Scouts. And during a cookie sale, they received a dollar bill with a strange handwritten message. According to his story, the girls found it when they got home and counted the money raised. On the margin of the bill, a mysterious message was written. My name is McKelly Biggs, kidnapped from Mesa, Arizona. I am alive. The officers who attended to the Girl Scouts father conducted a search in their files and found information about the case. They contacted the Mesa police Initially, the officers from the Arizona locality where the disappearance occurred doubted the message's authenticity as Mikkel's name was spelled incorrectly, missing an L and the final E. However, they soon concluded that this bill was sufficient to reactivate a case that had been forgotten. The investigation into the first lead in almost two decades began immediately. The girl's family was more skeptical, asserting that Mikkel would never have made such a mistake when writing her name. Moreover, they mentioned that the handwriting did not resemble hers. However, the case investigators did not believe it was a cruel joke. While the missing letters in the name ruled out the possibility that Mikkel herself had written it, detectives valued the hypothesis that the author might be someone with knowledge of the case. As they began to dig deeper, detectives encountered several elements that raised doubts about the message's authenticity and made it difficult to generate new leads from this piece of currency. One factor was that this dollar bill was put into circulation in 2009, 10 years after Mikkel's disappearance. It also would not be easy to lift a fingerprint that could be analyzed. What seemed like a promising lead quickly turned into another frustrating dead end. After this hopeful discovery faded, the years continued to pass and what happened to Mikkeli remains a great mystery. Despite the time elapsed, the Bigs hold out hope of finding closure. However, in their worst moments, they at least wish to know who took her to have the closure they deserve and need. The family is convinced that the person who took her was known in the neighborhood, which is why no one saw anything suspicious. It has been decades of anguish for each family member. Kimber shared that the early days were especially difficult for her parents. Darian had to endure not only the loss of his little girl, but also being considered a suspect. From her room, Kimber could hear her mother crying when she went into her sister's bedroom. For years, the Bigs have circled back to the same questions over and over again. How could Mikkel disappear in such a short amount of time? And how is it possible that no one saw or heard anything? In those seconds, the Biggs' lives were turned upside down. And though it was very hard, the parents strove to move forward for the sake of their other children. They moved to another town, also in Arizona, and sought refuge in religion. Nonetheless, Kimber acknowledges that the disappearance of her sister at such a young age left an indelible mark on her. As she grew up and became a mother, the memory of that January day and the nightmare they lived through leads her to never lose sight of her son.
She still dreams that one day Michaela might walk through the door, ending the nightmare. She thinks that if this has happened with other missing children, it could also happen with her sister. Kimber created a page on a well-known social network called Justice for Mikkel Biggs, through which she keeps her sister's case alive, hoping someone will contact her with information that could make a difference. Additionally, since her sister's disappearance, Kimber has become an advocate for other missing persons cases. At the end of 2023, Kimber was hired by the National Criminal Justice Training Center to give a presentation as part of a course aimed at teaching investigators how to properly handle victims' families in missing persons cases. She says she was meant to become an advocate for missing people and their families. I had many people thank me for what I do and give heartwarming feedback. I like to let them know I am eager to hear what could be improved to better help them, but every time they insisted it was perfect as is, which is both mind-blowing and dignifying, she wrote on Facebook after the event. I am grateful, optimistic, and extremely motivated to continue in this and beyond to see what this world has in store for me. Almost a quarter of a century has passed since McKelly disappeared, and Kimber assures that they will never stop fighting to uncover the truth. And well, that concludes today's case. As always, I appreciate your support for my work. If you subscribe, like, and share this video, it will help me continue creating content. See you soon.